Hey, Under Pressure Dive Buddies. If you've been diving for a while, you've probably been on a really good dive with a great dive buddy. You've also probably been on a dive with a buddy that's, well, not so great. What makes one dive buddy fantastic and makes another give you the urge to embrace the cancel culture? How can you make sure that you are a good dive buddy? No, a great dive buddy. Let's dive in to what makes a great dive buddy. Get your gear on because it's time for to descend into another episode of the Under Pressure Divecast. I'm your host, Scuba Steve. Scuba diving is a fun and exciting adventure sport and take it from me, you can be a diver. And to help you get there, the Under Pressure Divecast is here dedicated to promoting and discussing recreational scuba. So what are we gonna talk about today? Well, we have a little bit of news um, there's no, sh well, a little bit of show news. And then, uh, we'll talk about what does it really mean to be a good dive buddy and, uh, what to look out for when you are searching for a dive buddy. We'll have a gear junkies garage as usual and a tip of the week. All right. So come on, let's make our descent. Okay, this week in the news, um, I wanted to talk about something that, that, you know, people talk about this on a pretty regular basis, but I think that's actually really, really important um, because we don't, there's so much about this topic that's wrong uh, that we really need to talk about it in the way that is right. And I don't really like frame things in right and wrong. But um, when it comes to conservation, especially in the case of what we're going to talk about today, and that's sharks, um, what's wrong is really destroying an apex predator in our ecosystems. So the news story that I came up with or that I found, and actually I'll put a, a link to this show in the, or the story in the uh, show notes uh, below, um, actually came from scuba diving.com and they did a survey of, of over a hundred films and the vast majority of them portrayed sharks as vicious predators where they were specifically intentionally preying on humans. And so the first thing is that absolutely isn't right. Um, we aren't the natural prey items for sharks. And I'm not going to make this whole episode about why sharks aren't the vicious predators that they are, that, that we portray them as, or that, that films portray them as they are a, an easy scapegoat villain, but, um, but that's not the point here. The point is how they're portrayed in the media. And, uh, we, we just need to get around the fact that these aren't uh, they don't need to be portrayed as vicious predators um, from that perspective. Um, and they do deserve conservation. That's very important to our ecosystems and our oceans. Some experts don't believe that, that, that this kind of portrayal um, is actually negatively impacting conservation. They talk about, well, Sharknado is so crazy and the premise is so ludicrous that even though it might be entertaining film, it's not damaging the, the impression that we have of sharks, but it reinforces even in the, at the extreme that it, that it takes the shark phenomenon or the shark movie genre. Um, it cre it perpetuates that creature as, uh, something that is vicious and to be feared. So I think it's a, you know, there are that expert probably knows a lot more about sharks than me and probably even knows more about conservation than me, whatever. Um, I still feel like there's a, uh, we need to realize that there has to be some kind of, of counterweight against that portrayal of sharks in the, in the, in, in, in media. Um, and so that's all I've got to say about that. It, it is an interesting read. The article points out a lot of, of interesting facts about sharks and shark movies, and they're not getting less 
uh, you know, they'll throw in, they'll throw in some kind of, of appeasement, you know, these sharks are blah, blah, blah. If you've watched Deep Blue Sea, they, there are characters who sort of try to tell the story that sharks aren't these vicious creatures or whatever. Um, but the premise of the movie hasn't changed. The action that happens in the movie hasn't changed. Still vicious sharks attacking people. So um, I, I just think it's important to, to look at that and keep it in mind. Um, like I said, the movies aren't getting less. I mean, we went from Jaws, which, you know, Peter Benchley spent many years after having made Jaws or written Jaws. Um, I, I, I don't want to put words in his mouth and say he regretted the screenplay, but he did work very hard for shark conservation for many years. So as a result of that, um, I think it's worth, worth talking about. Um, I did miss my show notes. Apparently I didn't put any, oh, I put none in the show news. Um, so there you go. I guess we don't have any show news. We're not going to talk about it. All right. Moving on to the main topic. So this week I wanted to talk about what makes a great dive buddy, because I, I think about, you know, some, sometimes you can almost think of your dive buddy as an automatic, something that just happens. Now, if you're fortunate enough to, um, have another diver that's close in your life, uh, a partner or a spouse or a good friend that is just ready to drop everything and go diving with you. That's great. Um, but sometimes you're going to be on a boat or on a pier and you're going to be there by yourself or you're going to go with a, to, uh, to a lake with a group and you're going to have to pair up to get uh, in the water. And what does that look like? Now you're stuck with some, I shouldn't say stuck with, but you're partnered with somebody you may not know very well. And what does that mean to you as a scuba diver? Um, and, and so I want to share a few stories from my own experience. So when I was uh, a very new diver in 2002, I went to Cairns, Australia, and I was diving with, um, I, I connected with a, a photographer from Wisconsin. His name is Dave. Um, I've since unfortunately lost track of him, which is a, a bummer. But, but he, uh, if you are a patient diver, photographers are the people to go with because they dive slow and they pay attention to what's going on around them instead of speeding around the reef. And so that, that little advertisement for diving with photographers, uh, uh, has been brought to you by Olympus. No, I'm just kidding. Um, the, the Dave was a really great dive buddy. Um, I had my first real problem on a reef, um, uh, when I was diving with him on a wall and we were at about 40 feet or so, I think my computer said 43, something like that. Um, there was a, you know, a very good distance under us and 40 feet to the surface. And we were on a sheer wall. There was no, um, there was no level area there. And I had just bought a new mask that I was really excited about. That was, um, it was a polycarbonate with, with, um, I don't even know how to say it, wrap around lenses and a black frame. And so it was supposed to be, you know, all the rage at that point, a wider field of view and, and all that. Um, and the strap broke or didn't break, but came undone. And to be honest, I won't na name the mask or the manufacturer, but it was basically a crap mask. It was a scuba diving mask, but it was just, I, I think they threw it together, uh, you know, over a weekend with maybe a little too much beer. And, and so, uh, the mass strap came undone and I'm at 40 feet. I'm a brand new, this is probably my 30th dive ever, something like that. I mean, seriously new. I had just gotten my advanced open water when I went to Australia. Um, so there was a potential for me to, to, to panic and, um, you know, 40 feet is plenty of room to hurt yourself. So, uh, the, I, to my own credit, I didn't freak out, but I was very, very uncomfortable at that point. I managed to, to, uh, catch my mask though. Dave's hand was on it 
as fast as my own. So he was paying attention, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But, um, and, and, you know, at that time, my buoyancy wasn't great. So he was able to grab my BC shoulder strap and help me maintain, uh, you know, kind of our position in the water column while I got my mask sorted out. And so uh, we, I finally got it back on. Uh, I, he asked me if I was okay. And I said, no, I'm not okay. We need to go up. We went to the surface and I was done. I couldn't go back down. And that meant that Dave was going to have to call his dive because we weren't, um, we weren't with a larger group or he could find some, uh, you know, uh, another, another dive buddy pair that they could triple up. And we, I won't talk about tripling up today, but, um, that it's usually not ideal, but anyway, I told him I was done and he was super cool about it. He said, okay. And we just swam back to the bo boat, got on board and, you know, uh, hung out on the boat. And, and I, to this day, really appreciate that as um, the right way to handle a dive. Now, is it a bummer when your dive buddy has to call a dive? Sure, of course it is. But um, it isn't worth the consequences of being a jerk about it. And so in contrast to that experience, I was doing a eco dive in one of the local reservoirs. And this, this is really an interesting dynamic because we, there were probably 20 divers at the eco dive. We were diving in the Marina underneath the piers, cleaning up junk, right? Um, lawn chairs, boat, boat motors, you know, whatever people dropped over the side and couldn't get. And I, I talked about this uh, a little bit in the last episode, in the last episode, because, um, I started to get vertigo. And, um, like I said, in the last episode, I, we were in relatively shallow water. I went down to the bottom of the, the reservoir, got oriented, went to the surface, told my buddy I was done. He was a complete jerk about it, which was funny because there were, 19 other divers in the water. There was no reason for him not to be able to pair up with somebody else easily, conveniently, um, whatever. Anyway, total jerk about it. Like I said last time, uh, turned out when I got home, I had 104 degree fever. Uh, didn't feel guilty at all about calling that dive, right? And so um, those are you know, kind of contrasting experiences that I've had in terms of what is a good dive buddy and what is, you know, a negative or a bad dive buddy. Um, I did have another experience when I was doing my deco training. Um, my instructor had organized a trip to Blue Hole and Rock Lake down in New Mexico so we could do some deep dives. And um, it was the, the morning we were getting ready to go, and the person that, that my instructor had paired me with came down to the table, slammed their stuff down on the table and, and said, I am just so angry this morning, but with expletives and a lot of loud, obnoxious behavior. And honestly, I wasn't going to go to 150 feet with somebody like that in that, in that condition. And after breakfast, I sat down with my instructor and I said, instructor, I'm not diving with them. I'm sorry. It causes a problem. I understand that, but that's not happening. I'm not going to feel safe. Um, and so consequently, it, I mean, if it had been a 60 foot recreational dive in a controlled environment like blue hole or something like that, I might have watched their behavior and made the decision a little later in the morning. Um, but I was in a training class doing open water training below, you know, far below the recreational limit. I'm not going to do that. So, um, and, and in that case, I made the decision 
that this is not somebody I wanted to dive with before I even hit the water. Okay. And sometimes you have to do that. And when you're on a boat and you're, you're pairing up with people, you're going to have to look for people to dive with. And you're going to have to think about what that means to you. Right. Um, so if you're, uh, so, so let's go through some of these, some of these things. Let's go through some, some dive buddy do's things that you should look for in other divers, but also work towards being yourself. And the first one that I think we need to talk about is being prepared. When you get to the boat, you need to, or, or the pier or the dive site. Let's just say if we get to the dive site or the transportation hub, which might be a pier, it might be a bus, whatever it is, you already know what the status of your equipment is. Whether you rented it, whether you bought your own gear and you're taking it with you, whatever that situation is, you know it already. You've got your gear ready to go and uh, and you've checked it twice, maybe three times, maybe compulsively, whatever it takes so that when you, when you get to that transit hub where you're going to meet the other divers, you're ready to go. And that's not just ready to go with your equipment. That's ready to go in your head. You know, you've gotten enough sleep. You're not dehydrated. You've had breakfast or you didn't have breakfast, depending on the time of day, whatever, you know, that you're, you're, you're feeding your body. You're taking care of your brain. Um, you, uh, whatever you need to do in preparation for those dives, you've already done in advance and have the respect for the other people on the boat to do that. I think that's really important. The second thing I want to talk about is staying close to your dive buddy. And so when, when I was training 19 years ago, we talked about staying close closer to your dive buddy than you'd want to swim on one breath of air. Because if your tank runs out, then that's how far you've got to go. Well, I'll be honest with you. That's ludicrous. Okay. Once you're at the, we'll do a running out of air episode, I think, because that's, that's an, an accident that should never, ever, ever, ever happen. Okay. That is, the one thing that happens underwater to people that is 100% preventable. Okay. So you want to stay close enough to your dive buddy. If you're a new diver, you should be able to reach out and touch their BC or their tank valve or something. And if you're a new dive buddy and you're diving like this or this, where you're not necessarily parallel, that's okay. Just make sure that if you're this person, you're looking over your shoulder occasionally to make sure you know where your dive buddy is, right? That they're always there. And you can brief that. You can say, hey, I'll stay on your left as much as possible, or I'll stay on your right as much as possible. And that way, your dive buddy's not wasting time looking for you. You know, they glance over their shoulder, you're there, okay, fine. Right? And if they're if you're not there, then they know that you must be out of position for a reason then they have to look for you a little harder. Stay close to your dive buddy. If you are a more experienced diver and you feel like a few more feet is okay, that's fine. But if you if you were brought up in the diving industry like I was with some of these sayings of, you know, how far do you want to swim without air? If you're at 60 feet and you don't have any air, you do not want to swim before you have a dive buddy to share air with. Right. So that, that rule is, is insane. Okay. We just that forget that rule, be close enough where you can get to your dive buddy very quickly and don't run out of air because that's a completely preventable accident. So the next thing I want to talk about is diving within the most restrictive limit between you and your buddy. So if you're less well-trained than your buddy is, and, and well-trained is probably not the right word. If you're less experienced, and have less training than your buddy, then your experience and level of training is the limiting factor. If you're more, more experienced and have more training, then your buddy's experience and level of training will be the limiting factor. All right. And this, this is not, I'm not talking about training scenarios. We're talking about recreational scuba diving. So you're, you met a dive buddy on the boat, 
they've got 25 dives, you've got 450 dives, their training is the limiting, or their experience is the limiting factor, right? Because they are more likely to find, a, find themselves in a position in which they're uncomfortable, or they're more likely to not remember how to operate something when they need to, or not have a piece of equipment that you might have as a more experienced diver that they end up needing or wanting in a position underwater. So the most limiting dive experience and level of training is the one that you dive to when you're together. So we always like to pair up with people who have similar levels of experience because then we have, there's not really any, that we're self-limited for the most part in that respect, which means that we can maximize our own dive experience. Well, that's okay. I will tell you this, I was super happy that Dave was willing to dive with me in Australia and that he took the time to take care of a new diver. That meant a lot to me as a new diver getting into the dive community. And so if you're an experienced diver, you might consider taking a new diver under your wing and just realizing that you're not gonna go below 60 feet or 40 feet, whatever that diver feels comfortable doing. Um, so that's something that I really wanna stress is that, that the limitation on, and, and let's be real, if you're on a reef, the, the difference in the experience between 40 feet and 80 feet, you know, there is a lot of really cool stuff at 40 feet because there's more light there, right? And yes, there are things at 80 feet that aren't at 40 feet, but the, you can still have a really, really fantastic dive even if you're not at 80 feet. And so keep that in mind. Um, uh, so, so the other thing I, I wanna talk about, and I've already alluded to this a little bit, is always be ready and willing to be okay calling a dive. If you need to call a dive, you need to take care of yourself. Because if you have, if you don't call a dive because you're nervous or you're self-conscious about it, or, oh, I don't want to ruin this other person's day, then you put yourself at risk of having an accident because you're not, your mind is not where you want it to be, or you are not where you want to be. And if you have an accident, you're very likely to put your dive buddy at risk. So we don't want to do that. So not to mention, you go to the surface now thinking that diving sucks. Right? And, we, and as a community, we don't want you to think diving sucks. We want you to think scuba diving is the most awesome thing ever. Every single time you get in the water, I don't care if you're on a reef in, in uh, the Philippines or Indonesia, or if you're in Carter Lake here in Colorado and you have two feet of visibility because it's a really clear day. Um, it, every dive needs to be awesome. So take care of yourself. And if you don't feel like diving, Get out of the water, call the dive. Even if you have to, like I said, even if you have to call it before you ever get in the water, say, I'm not doing this. And so, um, yeah, that's it. Um, the other thing when you're, when you're a dive buddy, one thing to do that's good is to communicate expectations. Be communicative. Don't just nod your head when your dive buddy says, hey, we're gonna go down to 80 feet, we're gonna see this wreck, we're gonna do all this stuff. And you're like, <laughs> maximum depth I've ever been to is 40 feet. I've not been trained to deep dive. I don't feel comfortable doing that, but I feel peer pressure, so I'm gonna do it. Um, you know, communicate with your dive buddy and be receptive to communication, okay? When somebody says, hey, that, that worries me a little bit. So here's where we get into a trap, right? And this is the encouragement trap, where we say, you know, that, 80 feet is a little much for me. I'm a little concerned about that. And, you know, as divers, we're almost always going to downplay, and well, as humans, we're almost going to always downplay our fear and try to put on that brave face, right? But if your dive buddy expresses that to you, what's our response? Well, what can we do at 60 feet? What can we do at 40 feet? And, and do the same dive. Or if you're on the boat and somebody says, hey, you know, 80 feet's too much, and it's super important to you to get down to that wreck at 80 feet, work with the dive master or the rest of the team on the boat and repair up. 
if possible. Now, it may be that there, there's one newbie on the boat and everybody else is an experienced diver and they, you might, somebody, it would be great for the dive community if somebody would say, okay, you know what? I'm good doing that. I'll do a 40 foot dive with you. I'm cool. So remember a 40 foot dive can last a lot longer than an 80 foot dive. So that's something to think about too. Um, but communicate your expectations. If you're the more experienced diver, say, hey, this is what I expect to do. How does that feel to you? And let them sort it, right? Let them say, well, that's too much or no, that sounds good. So what I was going to get to with the encouragement trap is that somebody says, I don't feel comfortable going to 80 feet. And you say, oh, it's all good. It's the, the visibility is great. The water, water's warm. Um, we're going to have a great dive. Um, you know, and, and you can do it. I'll be right there with you. So there's a point at which encouragement becomes peer pressure. And we need to be very careful about drawing that line and saying, you know, at some point, and, and what is it? And it could be very situationally dependent, right? That diver could, you could, you could be seeing a little bit of nervousness, nervousness because they've never been that deep. And then you're like, well, I'll be right with you. We'll, we'll take it slow. If you decide at any time that you want to stay at the depth that we're at, you just let me know, this is it. I'm good. Then I'll, we'll stop and that'll be great. If you can provide that kind of environment and then check in with them when you're underwater, are you okay? You know, and if they say, well, I'm not okay, then let's go up a little bit. Right? So, um, we, we don't want to get to the point where our encouragement, which, you know, intellectually, we're probably trying to be helpful, but deep down, we probably want to go to that wreck and we're trying to get this person to do it. And we're trying to be nice and we're trying to work within the social system that we have. Um, try to step above that if you're an experienced diver and say, you know what, how do I help this person to their comfort level? And then how do I just have a great dive with them? Because that's better for the industry. And honestly, you're going to have a great dive. I mean, how many times that's a great dive is 90% in your head. If you can have a great dive in Carter Lake, you can have a great dive anywhere, right? At any depth, it's all up to you. So those are some dive buddy do's and I kind of squeezed in some don'ts there. Um, dive buddy don'ts. One of the ones that, that really gets under my skin is, um, well, you know, I, I didn't even list this one, but I got I've got to say this, putting yourself first. Okay. Um, to the point where you will allow negative consequences for your dive buddy. You'll allow them to go into a situation where they are uncomfortable or where they're not trained. Um, uh, going into a, a, going too deep, going too fast, going into a cave. Don't even get me started. Um, so, so don't put your own dive experience before your dive buddies. If you can't come to an agreement on the surface about what a great dive looks like, then switch buddies. Or like I said, put yourself in a different mindset and provide another diver a great dive. And you'll have a great dive too, if you want to. Um, so the next one is don't listen to the dive briefing and then do your own dive anyway. You know, if you're in a structured dive situation, dive the briefing. You know, what did they say? Plan the dive and then dive the plan. Um, ignore your buddy. Okay, so you've gotten all paired up and you get in the water and then you're doing your own thing. You know, you're not even paying attention. Diving is funner, more fun, more funner when there's people to share it with. And why do we take cameras underwater? They're not necessary for diving. In fact, they're kind of an added problem, but we take them because we want to share the experience with other people. We want to post, post them on, on the internet. We want to share them with family, share that immediate experience with someone. And they should be right there. Right. Um, 
I've had two dive experiences where uh, both of them were later, you know, in in uh, after at least 10 years of having been diving. So when they happened, I didn't really care about my, because I didn't feel unsafe myself, but it was annoying. So I went to Anacapa, I think 2000, uh, 12, something, 10, 12, that, it doesn't matter. Um, and I got paired up with someone else, you know, someone I didn't know. And, you know, by then I was pretty experienced, wasn't too worried about it. And we got in the water and he was gone. Right. And I finally found where he was and I started following him. But then you have to say, okay, now am I going to stay with this buddy who is just speeding around the reef? And, and I don't know if he, I don't remember now if he had doubles on or something, but he must've had a ton of air because he was just, or maybe he was just super efficient lungs, but he was just gone. And so then I'm looking around saying, okay, if I get into trouble, is there someone else I can? And of course it was a cattle boat as they say. So there were lots of people in the water. So I took the time to catch up to him and then, you know, but I spent the entire dive chasing this guy and that doesn't make a great dive for me. Um, I saw some kelp, <laughs> you know, but, but it wasn't super awesome. There was, uh, because I was playing catch up with this guy. I don't think he saw anything, but anyway, I also had this, a similar experience in Puerto Vallarta where I had to really keep up with, uh, a dive buddy who was clueless, you know, just speeding along, going wherever, um, so pay attention to your dive buddy. Um, and, and part of it is, is on the boat. You know, I'm a slow diver. I have no intention of racing you along the reef. I'm going to, I'm going to look, I could look at one rock for an entire 40 minute dive and be perfectly happy. You know, maybe not in Carter. I'd have to swim around a little bit in Carter Lake, but, but in the ocean, there's so much to see that I like to take my time. I like to let things, you know, wildlife and whatever sort of not be disturbed by, by me and the other divers, but that's not a universal, a universal way of looking at diving. So if you're pairing up with someone on a boat, you need to think about that and say, Hey, how do you like to dive? What if I want to look at a rock for the entire time? Is that going to be cool? Or are we going to have a problem? And that's confrontational. Don't ask it that way. Um, but you can say, you know, I'm a, I'm a slow diver. I like to just cruise, find somebody who's okay with that. And, uh, you might be able to, if you're an experienced diver and you like to cruise, you might be able to introduce a younger, newer diver or an older, newer diver to a more relaxed dive experience than they might be used to. So think of it as an opportunity potentially for some divers. On the other hand, you also need to take care of yourself and say, I don't want to dive with someone who's going to speed along the reef. So if you talk to them on the surface and they're not totally comfortable with the idea of just relaxing, see if you can find somebody else who's, who's more into that. Find a photographer, really good. Um, at least a good photographer. Um, Next dive buddy, don't, don't expect your dive buddy to take care of you. Putting together your gear, keep tracking, keep track of your air, keeping track of your depth, planning the dive, um, or knowing how to read your dive computer or use your equipment. So that's part of being prepared. And I talked about this earlier, part of being a good dive buddy is being prepared. That means knowing how to work your BC knowing where your weights are, understanding how to read the screen on your computer underwater. Uh, you know, if it's not air integrated, then you need to have a, a pressure gauge, right? And, you know, you need to be reading that. So make sure you're an independent diver, that you're taking care of yourself and that you're capable of taking care of yourself. And at the same time, don't expect to be taking care of your dive buddy. Okay. They should be an independent diver as well. If they need help because their gear is too heavy out of the water. 
of course, we help. If they forget something because they're excited or a little bit anxious, you can certainly provide them uh, a little bit of feedback, but expect to dive with independent divers and certainly expect it of yourself. Um, I already said this once, but I'll say it again. Don't run out of air. Um, that puts yourself at risk and your dive buddy at risk and it's completely avoidable. So don't do that. Uh, don't break the dive profile. Like I said earlier, dive, uh, brief, uh, plan the dive and dive the plan. That's also completely avoidable. You know, we make dive profiles for a reason. And if you're on a boat and they make the dive profiles, they're doing it for a reason because they have a schedule that they want to keep. They're going to do a hundred foot dive or a 60 foot. Let's, let's go with a 60 foot dive. Uh, and then they're going to have lunch. That's going to have a certain amount of surface interval. And then they're going to have another dive at 45 feet. And they're expecting everybody to be able to make the same dives throughout the day. And so if you can't make that second dive because you went to 80 feet looking at something on that first dive, then that actually uh, is a disservice to your dive buddy because now they don't have somebody that they can dive with that second dive. Or you put yourself at risk if you don't tell anyone and you dive it anyway, right? So don't break the dive profile if it's, if it's a planned dive, scheduled dive, whatever. If you're diving computer and you're diving with a buddy and you guys decide mutually underwater to change your plan because of a, some event happens, you see some cool thing 20 feet further down the reef and you want to make that decision together and understand the consequences of that for the rest of your dive day, then that's a choice you need to make. But if you're with a group where there's an expectation that you're going to have more dives throughout the day, you need to stick to the plan. So um, don't arrive late. Don't be that person. You know, be early or at least on time to that transportation hub, whether it's the pier where you're going to meet the boat, whether it's the parking lot where you're going to meet the truck, you know, and, and go to the beach, whatever it is, just be on time, get up a little bit earlier and be ready to go with your gear. Don't be waking up in the morning and say, Oh, I got to put my gear in my bag. Do that the night before, you know, be ready to go. Now, if you're an Uber morning person and, and you have plenty of time in the morning cause you get up really early, that's fine. You know yourself, but be ready and, and be on time. Um, one thing I want to talk about, and you could, you could do list after list after list of good dive buddy, bad dive buddy scenarios. Um, I'm touching on ones that really matter to me. I'm sure that there are others that you could go through. One last one that I want to talk about is practical joking might be funny on the boat, but it is absolutely not funny underwater. Okay. Um, uh, especially with uh, new divers, you think you're being cute or whatever, but you end up uh, potentially really increasing their anxiety level and making their dive experience uh, less awesome. And we don't want to do that. Uh, not to mention that you can get to the point where something is unsafe. And we certainly don't want to introduce anything unsafe uh, underwater. And we don't have to. That's the awesome thing. Scuba diving is fun and exciting without any addition from us. Just the world that we're in is fun and exciting. So we don't need to add to that. Okay. Um, so just say no to practical joking. All right. So... Uh, just to kind of tie up a few tips to be a really great dive buddy. We already talked about a lot of things that you can do. Um, be relaxed, be relaxed about, about the dive. And I don't mean not to be excited. Perfectly cool. I want you to be excited. Everybody wants to be excited about their next dive, but be calm, be relaxed. And, uh, that means relaxed in your, in your self, in your training, be comfortable with your gear. Make, you know, you know that it's ready. You, you know, it's serviced. You've taken care of all of that. 
so you can be calm and composed. Um, I said this before, but be willing and able and happy to dive within the limits of your buddy. Like I said, if you, if that means it's a 40 foot dive, enjoy it, enjoy a 40 foot dive. If that means it's a 80 foot dive and you're in, and you're qualified and, and experienced enough to do that. And so is your buddy. Great. Enjoy that dive. You know, just be ready and willing to dive within the limits of whoever is the most limiting and be willing to share that limitation with your dive buddy. If they come to the, come to the boat with the, the super expensive gear and the dive log. Well, I know people are going to digital dive logs and, and yeah. Um, but they come to the boat with a big old thick dive log that looks like it's 50 years old or whatever. You still need to have enough self-confidence to say, yeah, I'm not doing that. You know, I, I, I don't want to go to a hundred feet. I don't want to go in a cave. Um, it, you know, I, whatever it is, just say, I'm not comfortable with that. Um, just do it before the dive, you know, when they're, when they're briefing it. And then, uh, you know, in keeping with what I said before, be an independent diver. So you're taking care of yourself on the boat or, uh, even in the water, you're taking care of yourself so that if your dive buddy needs you, you're okay, but also you're not needing them to, uh, to, Hey, what's your air? Hey, how deep are you? You know, um, I have had dive buddies that I had to chase down the reef a little bit and kind of grab their tank and go, Oh, Nope, Nope. Come on. We're not going down there. And it's not because they were, you know, maliciously doing something wrong. They just were so excited about seeing something that they followed it. And what they, what we don't realize as humans sometimes is that those animals are in their natural environment. And if you follow them, you might go somewhere where you're not supposed to be. And there have been times, there was a time in Bonaire when I was chasing a turtle and I was, and at 93 feet, I'm like, okay, I'm done. But EAN 32, I'm not to mention, you know, at, at 93 feet, you're burning your bottom time. So, um, you have to turn back and say, okay, all right. So that's it. I guess I just want to say, be a great dive buddy because it's, it's not just, you're going to have a better experience when you have a positive interaction with another diver and they're going to have a better experience. And especially if you're an experienced diver and you're willing to reach out to new divers, help them appreciate the sport. That's huge for our industry, right? Because then we have committed divers who like diving, who had an experience where somebody reached out to them when they were new and then they can in turn reach out to other divers when they're more experienced. So there you go. Do that. Be a good dive buddy. All right, let's talk about the gear junkies garage. Okay. So I'm going to, this is going to sound lame, but I actually think it's really important and it's cheap. Well, I mean, yeah, it's cheap. Get a water bottle. And it's not just about, my name says scuba Steve, it needs to be redone, but I, I'm not being flippant here because what we need to do is commit to hydration. And this, this particular bottle has migrated to my office, but when I travel, I take it with me and I fill it at the hotel or wherever. And I take it out wherever I go. There's two reasons for this. One reason we need to stay hydrated is diverse. Uh, the air we breathe is super dry and our lungs are very efficient at getting rid of any moisture in our bodies. So we need more hydration. The second reason is when I get out of the water, there's one piece of equipment that I will never ever put in a dunk tank. And that is my mask. And so I usually keep a little bit of water in my bottle between dives to swoosh it out. Swoosh. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Swoosh might be a closer to a real word, um, to, to clean out my mask or at least rinse it before, uh, the next dive. And then, you know, obviously you can clean it better when you get back to your room or your, or your home or whatever. But 
you know, just get a get a water bottle that you can, uh, you know, use one of those not real carabiners and you can carabiner it to your to your dive bag. So it's always part of your dive kit. You know, you can get them pretty cheap. You can get a really good one for 20 bucks or whatever if you want to go that far, but you don't have to. The only ones I, I wouldn't recommend are the bike bottles. Um, and the only reason I don't recommend them is because they don't have a clip. I mean, some of them might now, I don't know, but I like the ones that, can you, can you see this? I don't know. My fancy dark background is kind of killing me here. Um, there. So you can see, hopefully against my hand, this thing has a clip, right? You can, or a, a loop, so you can clip it to your gear. All right, enough said. Let's talk about the tip of the week. So one of the things that I, I have found as a diver, and, and uh, I think this will be something familiar to a lot of people, and that is that when we're scuba diving, um, there are times when you get all that gear on that your mobility is affected and we still need to get to things. And the most important one is, you know, reaching for a hose. Now there's lots of ways to get a regulator, but there's one way on a recreational scuba rig where you can always find an air hose. And that's reaching over the right side and grabbing any hose that's on that side is gonna be attached to a, a regulator, right? So there will be a second stage on the end of that hose if your, recreate, if your scuba rig is configured in a regular recreational configuration. So, um, so one of the things that I do at the gym is I do a couple of stretches every single time I go. Just no matter what, doesn't matter what I'm working out. I always do two uh, exercises. One is I always do this and stretch out this, those arms, both sides. And that allows me to get back over to that, not only to grab those hoses. And if you're an instructor, it's important because you need to be able to do the skill and you don't want to look like an idiot because you can't reach your own hoses to demonstrate, <laughs> but, um, but it also provides you access to the valve. Now that doesn't matter so much for, uh, recreational divers, unless you end up getting in the water without your valve on and it can happen. It's happened, uh, um, to a buddy I know in, uh, Bonaire, and why, why does it happen? You get out of the water or you're getting your gear ready. You turn the, the valve on to make sure that your, your tank is full. And then if you're going to travel any distance, you put the gear in a car or a truck or whatever, or a bus, and you turn the air off. You don't think about it when you get to the site and you can get pretty deep. Once you've let the air out of your BC, you can get pretty deep before you realize that you don't have your air on. Is that a catastrophe? No, because you can reach back and turn it on yourself. Or if you stay close to your buddy, which you should be doing, you tap them and say, Hey, I'm low on air because my tank is open. And if they're an experienced diver, they'll go, ah, yeah. And they'll tease you about it later, but that's okay. And, and turn your air on. So that's, that's one reason for that one. The other, the other one I do is that I stretch this way and so facing forward, stretch back as far as I can go. And um, always, I always do those because uh, if you have to remove and put your gear back on, uh, the more flexibility and strength you have in your arms, the, e the easier it is, at least in my experience, to make that happen. And so especially, um, like I said, when we're doing training, being able to do that skill as fluidly as possible sets a good example for your students. But um, in practical terms, uh, if, you've, if you have been diving, if you're not an, a diver or you haven't been doing it a long time, you might not have experienced this, but you know, you can, your gear can be pretty tight and it can be kind of hard to get your arms in. If you add a dry suit or a thick wetsuit, it's just one more thing. So the more flexibility you have in your arms, uh, the better. So stretching. All right. So you can contact the show, email me at scubasteve at updiveblog.com. 
visit theunderpressuredieblock.com for show notes where things like the link to that uh, article I talked about from scuba diving.com, things like that'll be there. You can find the audio version of the show on your favorite podcatcher. You can find me on social media at, at scuba Steve UPDB. Pretty much the only two things I really look at are Twitter and Instagram. Um, I do have a Facebook page, so I guess that's okay too. I check it every day. So, um, but the two I'm active on and really the one I spend the most time on, if I'm being honest, is Instagram. Um, so you can catch up with me there. Follow me. I'll follow you back for sure. Thank you for diving in with me today here on YouTube, or if you're listening to the audio program, uh, thank you for joining me there. On the left, you're going to see a playlist of episodes for your binge watching pleasure. If you've enjoyed this video and or podcast, don't forget to subscribe with the button in the middle of the YouTube screen or on your podcast.